So a very good evening and a very warm welcome to the next hour of discussion, which is um, looking back into the past to see how it can help us to plan for the future. Uh, it's called Cities and Ideas in the Ancient World, and it's part of the Festival of the Future City, which you know is brought to you by the Bristol Festival of Ideas. And um, I have to do a quick thank you, because this wouldn't be happening without the Arts Council England Innovate UK, Bristol City Council, and the University of the West of England. Um, so let me tell you that my name is Jenny Lacey, um, and I'm really delighted that we have two extremely eminent and entertaining classical experts with us. Um, so Edith Hall is a professor in the Department of Classics and Centre for Hellenic Studies at King's College London. She's the author of over 20 books. She's a broadcaster, and she acts as a classical consultant to theatre companies, including the National Theatre. And Bethany Hughes is an award-winning historian, author, and broadcaster. She's written and presented a huge number of television and radio documentaries, including a series looking at the ideas of Socrates, Confucius, and Buddha, which aired last weekend on BBC World and attracted a, I think it's fair to say, enormous worldwide audience. And she's also just about to deliver, I think on Saturday. On Saturday. <laughs> uh, isn't quite finished, A New History of Istanbul. I've got ten chapters to write. Before, so, so quite finished is an interesting use of the term. So um, I, uh, what we're going to promise you is a free-ranging and extremely interesting session about all kinds of things, and we're not kind of being terribly specific, so it'll be ideas and cities and all sorts of things. Um, and I think we're going to start with Bethany, but... Um, either can join in, and uh, we will have time for you as well. So um, let's start with where shall we begin? Where, where, what do we call the first city? How did cities begin? Um, well, it's a, that's a very interesting first question. Uh, uh, because, of course, as is the way with history and archaeology, the answer to that question changes pretty much every week of every year. Um, we did think, up until about ten years ago, we thought... Well, the, the kind of orthodox response to that would be to say there's um, a beautiful settlement in the kind of central southeastern bit of Turkey called Çatalhöyük, um, which dates back to about 7,000, 8,000 uh, BC. And this is the first city as we know it, in that it's the first complicated, organised town. And it is an amazing place. And if you can go there, I would absolutely recommend it because uh, you just get this sense of people. They, they, a lot of the houses are built underground. The burial practices are really interesting. The way society is organised is very interesting. There. So that's, that's if we'd been sitting here 15 years ago, that's that's what I would have said. But there's been an incredibly exciting discovery um, uh, slightly closer to the Syrian border in southern Turkey called Gobekli Tepe. Have, have, has anybody? Yes, you've, you, lady in the front's heard of this. Um, it's an incredible, a truly, truly remarkable site. Um, that dates back 12,000 years. Um, it's somewhere around uh, 9,000, 10,000 BC that it seems to flourish. And it basically completely rewrites the story of civilization as we know it. Um, in that, up until now, what we've always said is okay, so people settle down, agriculture develops. When they settle down, they start to develop ways of negotiating living with one another, in particular religion. So if you're suddenly living together in a group day in, day out, you've got to work out a way that you establish your moral code and that you find a kind of spiritual consensus within that group. But Gobekli Tepe turns that on its head because Gobekli Tepe is just one enormous temple. And so it's the oldest religious building that's been discovered so far. And this is from a time where you have no settlements, you have no settled societies, so they are hunter-gatherers who are coming together and they're building this really... I mean, I get enthusiastic about a lot of things, but it really is a truly incredible place. So there are 16-ton cruciform blocks of stone. There are carvings that if I were to just to show you them blind and say, where did these come from? You would probably say, oh, aren't those gargoyles from a sort of 12th, 13th century European monastery? Incredibly beautifully done stone carvings. Very interesting things like a kind of lion entrance gateway and into the, onto the stone in the middle of the gateway an, an image of a woman um, has been scratched 
and uh, this woman's naked and she's sort of squatting and basically everything that can be going on uh, round a lady's front bottom is going on. So she looks like she's having sex and having her period and giving birth all at the same time. So it's sort of all happening there. It's very interesting that this, there's this image of this woman in the middle. So what Gebekli Tepe tells us is that people don't develop religion once they're living together in cities to try to work out a way to live together. They come together specifically to have some kind of religious experience. And then once they do that in this festive, collective way, at that point it then seems to be that they sort of think, oh, well, maybe we should do this more than once every three years or however often it was that they came together. So it's not the first city, but it seems to us that that is the first reason that people decide that they want to come together on a regular basis. So it's the kind of beginning of the idea of a city, and it's this temple, um, right? Just it's about five miles from the Syrian border, so the it's the, the archaeology is stopped there now, um, and there are just lots of lots of troops and migrants. But it but it's an incredible, really remarkable place. So I would say for me, that's where it begins. But God knows, you know, I'll open the paper tomorrow, <laughs> and there'll be colleagues who are working further east who who have discovered. Something you see, this is where we have the material culture um, <laughs> against written culture. I'm not really an archaeologist, but I'm not an archaeologist at all. But I, I have some problems just with stones. I mean, we don't know what they called that place. You call it Gebekli Tepe. Yeah. And you're absolutely right, it's there, and it's unbelievably fascinating. But for me, cities start when I can actually hear the words of ancient cultures. I'm, I'm, I could really boring, nerdy kind of classicist who likes to read ancient languages mm -hmm. and I like to read words and talk to people from antiquity. So here we get, actually, it's the third millennium BC and the actual tablets for the Epic of Gilgamesh mm -hmm. that, yet yeah, again, are, are dug up in, 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 in what's now Turkey and then Mesopotamian ep epic. But when Gilgamesh describes, and in fact commands, the foundation of Uruk, which is the great city that he wants uh, built in the Mesopotamian plain. This is a text. We can read this text. And it wasn't actually um, uh, deciphered until the 1860s by a very, very working class um, Londoner called um, memorably George Smith. <laughs> but George Smith <laughs> cracked this lot. And uh, when, when Gilgamesh commands the foundation of Uruk, he says it shall have wide roads, it shall have beautiful boulevards, and it shall have a temple of Ishtar, who's probably ultimately the same goddess that you're talking mm. about. But we've actually got a description of what a beautiful utopian place where everybody would want to go and share civic life would look like from the third century BC. So, the, uh, Sorry, the, th the third millennium BC. So that's kind of when I start to relate to these things. I, I find it very difficult dealing with architectural and archaeological remains without the words. Yes. Well, describe the words then, because that, it doesn't matter in a sense where we begin, but um, that's a great example of somebody actually having ideas yeah. about what a city would be like. So tell us a little bit more about that. What were the ideas of what he thought <clears throat> that a city should be, should have? Okay, actually, well, that's... that's a wonderful way in because in that text it's quite plainly a place for people to meet mm. it's plainly a pe place for people to um, appreciate beauty he he's determined that these are going to be beautiful buildings and wide boulevards it's going to be a sort of nirvana in in in, in the plain um, it's going to be somewhere which has the temple of ishtar it's also going to be somewhere where you can do trade that, he's very clear about that um, what it hasn't got that you really have to leap forward to actually the 7th century BC to find very clearly is the notion of the community in any sense as a political self-governing body and ancient history city talk right if you're an academic always revolves around that are you talking a physical place some kind of um, fenced in or topographical place, some sort of top of a hill, some sort of citadel, or are you talking about a political contract, a civic arrangement between people that makes you citizens, right? The word city, citizens. Is it um, a sociological category, bunch of citizens? You'd still all be 
the people of Bristol, if your buildings were burst to smithereens, we're seeing some of that in France at the moment, a, a, of a sense of what makes you a citizen, regardless of what they do to your material environment. And I don't find that in the Mesopotamian texts, or indeed the Egyptian <coughs> texts of not long after where they talk about the city. You don't get that sense of it's a political group that actually can be disempowered Bodied. Mm. And it's very, it's so, it's, that's so interesting because you're right, you, you don't. What you do get is a desire for togetherness. So in those, those Babylonian, yeah. exactly yeah. What, what you're saying, that the Babylonian cuneiform, there's a kind of one of the oldest examples of that that we have, which is, of course, in the British Museum. Where else would it be? Um, and it's a lovely, tiny little thing, tiny little clay tablet. And on it is written what people very much, when they met in a room like this, men and women, when they met together to prove that they stood on common ground and they wanted to look together to a better future. Um, it was a kind of aphorism, and I've just written it in the, in the guest book right. for, the, for this um, festival. Uh, they used to say, Anashulmi u balatu, to one another, and that means, are there any Babylonian cuneiform experts <laughs> in the room who can tell you? It's, it's not. Oh, do you put your hand up? Are you joking? No, I think she's, she's wiping her nose. <laughs> so she's she had a hanky. Uh, um, um, but what it means is actually, if you, if you sort of deconstruct it, you can work it. It, it means um, uh, to peace and to life. And shulmi is the peace bit, which then becomes shalom, salam, you know, that, that's passed down. Anna is the life bit, which is like anos, year, it was, uh, you know, a year was a, was a, a life cycle. Um, so uh, kind of incredible to me that even though, as you said, they didn't have a political structure in that way where people actually could describe how they lived their lives. I mean, we think, you know, they st people still protested. We still hear about them kind of challenging the king and lawyers and high priests about things, but they didn't have that kind of consensus. But this is what they want to do. And isn't that amazing mm. that 5,000 years ago, to peace and to life is what people say when they meet one another and how deeply paradoxical that, that, that it comes from that place, from Mesopotamia. Well, it's safety, isn't it? It's a sense of the safety in the city and many of the um, words I've been looking at the different routes for um, words to do with cities in Indo European and, and other languages what you know we have various different ones we use like you know urban as well as civic or city we have town we have borough we have all these different words and there's basically three types of concept underlying the words whether it's in the really ancient Mesopotamian languages, ancient Semitic languages, or in Indo-European, including sort of English and, and Dutch and German and French and so on. So you've got one idea which is actually the stronghold. It is a defensible space. And that is very, very powerful. The, word, the idea of the fence is actually in the Greek word polis, which, which we get political from, which is the word for a, a city-state. It's not just actually the little bit of built up city but it's the entire region so it wouldn't just be Bristol it would be Avon <laughs> okay it's a, it's a sort of defensible space and that's very very um, to the fore in, in many many languages but the actual word our word city the word that's being used in this uh, uh, for this festival is um, not like that at all I mean it's from it's from Kiwis and Kiwitas in Latin which are from a very old Etruscan root that's the sort of an indigenous people of Italy, and it is entirely about your equal rights. Mm. It's, this, it's this, this embodied notion. So you could put this kiwitas, which means the civic community of Bristol, could take you or put you on the moon. Mm. You would still be mm. the, the city, right, of Bristol. You would be Bristol City wherever you were put. Um, and there's a, a, a third kind of idea, which is um, more about measuring land and apportioning lots and that's actually the bur the burg stem um burrows so it's quite interesting to me that um we're going to talk about it later but can i throw gloucester in yeah now? yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. No, you, I'm so, it's clear that you know what in the whole <laughs> roman empire my two favorite cities are palmyra that we can certainly talk about later from what we can learn from it because you'll have seen it be blown up by daesh lately but that's in Syria, and it's in the Bute Desert. The second most favourite Roman city of mine is Gloucester. <laughs> Extraordinary place. So the Romans came. They only had four colonii in Britain. They didn't call it a, a city. They called it a colonial, which was an incredibly honorific term, 
which meant that they deliberately founded it because they thought it was in a beautiful place. And all the uh, what they, people they settled there were the pensioners, which means from 45 years old, of the 20th Legion. And it was founded, Gloucester, on the River Glam, which was also called, um, it's Sabrina the Seven. Sabrina means the, the River Seven. And it was exquisitely beautiful. You can still see the grid pattern that they founded it with when you go to Gloucester, you know, the High Cross, East Cross, the East Gate, all that stuff, very much um, a grid. Every domestic villa in that place had central heating and hot and cold <laughs> running water. I don't think it does now. <laughs> Internal toilet, mosaic floors, you name it. it Theatre. Um, they. What I really love is that they also identified the local goddess who clearly was like Artemis or Diana. She was a small game hunting goddess, which is what Artemis and Diana are, which is very much sort of peasant food. You know, little bunny rabbits, some little pheasants, things that you shoot with your bow and arrow. The, in Gloucester City Museum, which is one of the most delightfully eccentric places I've ever been, please go, there are statues to what we don't know her name, whatever the Romans came and found as the local goddess of shooting small game <laughs> in marshy territory, right? And uh, it, it was a superb place, much talked about in, in, in the Roman sources. I'm afraid Bristol wasn't there. <laughs> but that's the sort of thing that really excites me, is that, that was, it was just a small riverside, a little bit more, sorry, than a, than a, than a port, a, a place where ferries went off to Wales from. A little more than that. The Romans saw it as a place to build, AD 49, this place to put their mature men who wanted to settle after doing their 25 years service in the 20th Legion. And then they married local girls. Mm -hmm. And we're the result. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a very good. Um, let's ask you about your favourite. That's yeah. Edis. What's, <gasps> and what's your. You, it can be something that still exists, doesn't Gosh. exist, that there are they're kind of traces of. There are. <laughs> F favourite city? Ancient city, My yes. Goodness. Where, you would, where, would you like, <laughs> where would you like How to be? How long have you got? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, for different reasons, obviously. So I'll do three ones very, very, very quickly. Um, uh, so this isn't a city, it's a town, but it's as close as a city to a city that you could get uh, in 1600 BC, uh, is the little town settlement of Akrotiri on Thera, um, the oh. islands of Santorini, which, as I'm sure you will know, Santorini is one big volcano and um, it exploded in the visit, biggest geophysical event in the human experience, we think around six. 1615 now BC is, is, is kind of where we placed it and in that terrible destruction it preserved what is called the Bronze Age Pompeii it's actually miles better than Pompeii parche Mary Beard but it you know it is um it is an incredible city and it just speaks to me of the sheer grit and hope of what it is to be human, that you're stuck there on this little island that has very, very little water, and you have to force a civilization out of what you have. And on these walls, there are exquisite frescoes showing the life um, of these citizens. So we see them in boats, we see them um, developing the most incredible sailing technology. The women there are just splendid so they kind of romp around in fields collecting saffron we think that it was only women were allowed to collect saffron and particularly young girls and we know exactly what age they were because they all have their hair dressed or shaved in a different way so when you were pre-pubescent we think you had a kind of skinhead haircut and then you had this little sort of croppy thing with a sort of snake like bit growing out of your hair and then when you were a mature woman again as you're saying that probably means 24 or 25 <laughs> uh, you had lovely long luscious locks and this is all represented um, on the frescoes and uh, when you were a mature woman you were allowed to wear your massive boobs out of your dress so they had these dresses cut away to the waist and these kind of fantastic tits, excuse me, um, kind of on display, and it is the most incredibly heady place, but why it's exciting is that you just feel this um, absolute desire to try to understand those amazing people that you see on the frescoes, and then they tell us a bit about themselves, because they were so practical, because they did anti-earthquake engineering that hasn't been bettered yet in Japan, in the way that they built their homes, again, they had running water, uh, they were very kind of Norman Foster, it was all about light, so they had these great big huge windows so I think I just and the fact that they all died the most terrible death one night in 1615 BC makes me care for them deeply um, 
there was an earthquake before the actual eruption, and so people had time to get ready, and so a lot of the, of the possessions had been taken away. And of those that are left, it's just unbelievably touching. So there's, somebody's got a, there's a pot, and it's the same as all the other pots that you find from the period, and yet for some reason it was obviously special to this particular householder, so he or she has wrapped it up terribly, terribly carefully and, and put it like the sort of equivalent of putting it behind a table at the back in a corner of a room, and because of that it has survived. Um, and again, like with Pompeii, we don't have obviously any of the organic material, but we have the gaps left in the pumice and lava and they had these sort of Louis XIV uh, little stools and tables that they use. So, so I think that's just for its mystery and for what it says about the human spirit. That's that I probably, and it's not quite a city, but that's probably my favourite place. If you said where I, where I would like to go back to, I would like to go back to Sparta for a day just to see if the women were as feisty as the, as the Athenian sources tell us. They were the Athenians, the Spartans didn't really write their own history, but the Athenians were very keen to tell us that, in a, you know, they were critical, of course. Uh, Aristotle says it was a gynocratia, a state run by women, and that the girls there exercised naked and met, it all yeah, gets very salacious. They met late at night and oiled one another with olive oil and ate nipple cake shape, uh, nipple, nipple, um, tipped, shaped but Sparta cakes. is really interesting because <laughs> all the ancient, other ancient Greeks said it's not a city yes. because it, it, it doesn't, doesn't have walls. walls. That's right. So the Spartans live in this incredible plain under the Tegetus Mountains and they are so absolutely clear that they're as good at fighting as Gerard Butler that <laughs> you know, they, they are just the best hoplite phalanx in the world and they don't have even to have defensive walls. No. And they're the ones that they've got, we've only got two real poetic voices from Sparta, but one is actually called Tertius, and he wrote the marching songs that actually Gerard Butler and the rest of the 300 would have sung as they marched along, and it was to a particular metre called the Elegiac. Did which you want means, to sing it? Yeah, OK. da da di da da di da da di da 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 which is where the phalanx gets into order. But one of their most important elegies that we know they sang, like American Marines, you know, do, 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 was actually, a city is not a wars, but it's men, and mm. only men can defend it. Boom, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's exactly what they, they thought, and they were deeply proud of not having to have wars. And in fact... Um, their architecture was pretty miserable. <laughs> it was. <laughs> I mean, they had this one big uh, Apollo thing, yeah. um, and they had a nice temple for Helen, which um, uh, Bethany could tell you all about, and for Artemis. But basically, it was really unimpressive. And Thucydides, the Greek historian, who writes about what um, Pericles did for Athens which is construct that extraordinary set of temples encrusting the top of the Acropolis, which you see on every news show about the Greek economy, you see on every Victorian bank you know, that you go to, you've got a mini, mini Parthenon. Um, that is that image of what is a city centre, because it's certainly not a city in terms of where people lived. Ordinary Athenians lived out in their peasant small holdings all around the county, city-state of Attica, as they always had. But this encrusted, marble-encrusted rock in the middle. And Thucydides says that, you know, people will not realise how great Sparta was because it was such a great power. It defeated Athens, completely humiliated it in 404 BC in the Peloponnesian War. But there's nothing to see. Now, that leads us into actually one of the... I think we should throw this in if we're going to talk about ancient cities because... You know, there's a very big historical analytical view that's really got its basis in, in partly Thucydides and Aristotle, but then interpreted by Karl Marx, that you can't have a city without a surplus. Mm. And this is extremely important in terms of cities that have died out and disappeared and dark ages, including Santorini, Thera, um, and many, many other places where we know there was a great Bronze Age culture um, Knossos, Argos, Thebes, but then things fell apart for several hundred years. And the only um, sort of plausible argument for that, we can talk about religion or cultural change, I don't think there was that much, but is that once you lose your surplus, you may go and live in ruins, but you do not have money to make your city beautiful. 
mm. right? You simply don't have the money for that anymore. And we, you know, we've all watched post-apocalyptic movies about what would happen to London. You know, it's on Doctor Who the whole time, or Los Angeles, post-apocalypse. You know, we would all go back to the land to grow our potatoes and onions. We'd have no electricity. Some sort of basic barter would start up again. Cities are a luxury that only a surplus over subsistence economy can actually afford. And I would hold, you know, I, I believe Karl Marx was completely right about that. Um, and whenever you see a city that is decomposing and crumbling, there are some, for example, in Cuba, it's because they haven't simply got that money. And Pericles, who dreamed up the Acropolis and then had these fabulous architects and artists like Phidias and Actinus to come in and do it, had got, because of the Athenian Empire, his hands on a gold mine. And he decided to spend it making that Acropolis beautiful. He decided he wanted to be remembered for all time as the man <laughs> who dreamed up that city. Mm. And, and I think that's terribly interesting. We should be very, very grateful to people in the past who've actually used their surpluses to do that. In Bristol, of course, an awful lot of it was based on slavery, the, the beautiful buildings. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't enjoy, <laughs> if you like, just because it was bad money doesn't mean we can't enjoy the fact that people decided to make a beautiful environment for all of us from that. And I know Bethany's going to speak passionately later about heritage, mm -hmm. but I think it's if we've got any surplus left at all, our responsibility mm -hmm. to keep up our ancient buildings. Totally. And I just just to ask, I, kind of, it's a genuine question as well, with thinking about what money does for cities. And this is something um, Jenny just mentioned. This I've just done, looked at Socrates, Confucius, and Buddha, and try to understand what, if any, connections there are between them, and why they have. They're very different people operating very different systems and societies, but there are very interesting overlaps in what they think. And there's a an idea that one of the reasons these extraordinary thinkers come up with what they do when they do is firstly because they are all either living in cities or suddenly for the first time really connected to a vibrant city culture. And that means two things. It means that you're dealing with a mass, a population, and it might be that it started a couple of generations ago, but you're dealing with people who have been living in pretty much the same way for millennia. So they've been living dominated by tribal, village, and kinship bonds. And suddenly those are wrenched apart because you have these cities where you, anybody, well not anybody because it's all very restricted, but you have the possibility to migrate to them and to form new relationships within them. And of course that allows for opportunity and there are all kinds of things that you can do in a city, but that's very, very threatening and worrying as well. And cities become immediately very dangerous places. So is there an idea that these philosophers are working in an environment where people are really anxiously trying to work out how it is that they can live with one another without the very traditional forms that they've understood before? And that's particularly relevant to Confucius and the Buddha. And also, in those cities, exactly as Edith says, you've suddenly got people physically with change in their pockets. Mm. The, the citizen has suddenly become an economic actor. So whereas up until that point, the trade systems are totally dominated by the uh, castes of priests, by the kings, by the Gilgameshes um, of the world, you now have merchants who have a chance to make something of their lives and therefore seem to want to make something philosophically and ethically of their lives as well. So do you, I don't know, I mean, it's a genuine question, do you think money, as well as generating the beautiful heritage that they loved and that we need to look after, do you think that is also a stimulus to the creation of new ideas about what it is, or an articulation of new ideas about what it is? Well, to be I human? think it's the most precious thing money can buy, which is leisure. Yes, ex yeah, I absolutely. Think that that's, I think that's the real point. Yes. And again, again, it's also related to the economy. I don't know. Um, as much as you do at all about the Buddha and Confucius, but certainly in Greek, the Greek philosophers were very, very clear that uh, you couldn't think straight if you'd... Um, in fact, I've, my Aristotle bag is downstairs. I, could, I brought an Aristotle bag, which actually uh, says exactly this. Um, he was very, very clear that you can't devote your life to uh, thinking about why we're here how we should act and how we know what we know, which are the three great questions of Greek philosophy. Um, ontology is, why am I here? What is existence? <laughs> Ethics and politics is, how should I act? And the third question is, 
what's the difference between an opinion and a fact, which is what Socrates spent all his life wrestling with. Mm. Those are the three great questions of Greek philosophy. And they all said, you can't do that if you've got to earn mm. a living. Now, I actually prefer William Morris on this kind of thing. <laughs> I'm a great William Morris girl, that if we all in our commune did four hours physical labour and work and chopped our potatoes and everything and shared it, mm. and then after our four-hour days got our leisure to think. That's what I personally think. They didn't divide it like that in antiquity. Almost all ancient cultures had nine people working all day for every person who had leisure to be a philosopher king. And how did they yeah. decide? It's about the same now, to... actually, globally. Yes. How did they decide who got to be the tenth lucky person? <laughs> how did you, put, did you put yourself forward? Did you say, I can think? Well, it depended on the city-state. If you're living in a tyranny, then it's just inherited wealth. Right. Yeah. Um, if you're living actually in Athenian democracy or Republican Rome, uh, merit and ambition did have mm. opportunities. Cicero's from a, a notable example who got to the very, very top of society in the Roman Republic when he was actually from the, from the plebeian class. I mean, he did do it on sheer merit drive and, 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 and um, some good luck. And you could do that up to a point in classical Athens. Um, but I would actually question whether we can really do it now in our, our, our current climate when 7% of our children go to private school, but if you look in Parliament or whatever, the proportion of private school people is not exactly 7%, mm. is it? So I would question our right to judge the ancients yeah. on inherited privilege. It's also, it's a very, very obvious thing to say, but of that nine, three of them were slaves as well. So these, of course, are slaves. I mean, no, it's, I know and that we know And the slavery it took to build the Acropolis. Yeah, I mean, yeah, what, I mean exactly. they had to get those stones from that mountain, which is like 12 miles away, yeah. they, Pantelicon. Um, the, the physical labour involved in getting that up there, yeah. uh, the suffering, the weight in the, of stone and boulders and rollers in the heat. Uh, uh, you, there's nothing you can do to actually really come to terms with, no. with that. And only the Athenian Empire and slavery could do that. Yeah. OK, I, what I'm, I'm very conscious of is you both keep saying, we'll get to that later. <laughs> and it's kind of getting later. <laughs> so I think we need to do some of the things we promised to do. Who wants to do Palmyra? Edith. I'll kick off with Palmyra. It's because Palmyra, I, sorry. It doesn't matter, Palmyra. Mm. Um, because I expect most of you have seen pictures of it on TV lately. That's really the other reason uh, I chose it. The other one was that it's at the far end of the Roman Empire from Gloucester. I mean, <laughs> you, can't, you can go from rainy Gloucester in, in Britannia um, to this glamorous desert city in, 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 in the east. Now, it was definitely the product of surplus. It fits all the arguments that we've made. And it's not actually all the way till the second century AD that what you've seen on television being blown up by people who claim to be men of God um, was actually built. Um, but because it was on the old silk route and it was built, it was it's the site of the most amazing oasis. Uh, it's partially dried up now. But we know from ancient botanists that there were 220 different species of palm tree fringing this oasis. I mean, it was devastatingly beautiful. And so all the Romans who ever went there, they often went there for sex holidays, right? I mean, it was just like this desert oasis mm -hmm. where you went. Um, and Hadrian took his, his beautiful young boyfriend there mm -hmm. and um, decided to build it up. And in the second century AD, it gave it special rights. They didn't have to pay so much tax to the Romans. They were allowed to keep their surplus, and that allowed them to use their surplus, which was basically they took a huge amount of money off every car camel caravan that went through the city to build the extraordinary things that, that, that you have seen on television. And it's one of the most important examples of the grid plan. And we haven't talked about actual town planning much today. So here's a bit of a chart. There's a big difference between cities that evolve, if you like, naturally, and cities that are rather suddenly designed in antiquity. And it's, it's quite simple. If a community builds up into a city, it's almost always rather an amorphous but basically round shape centering on a meeting place. So everybody who's going to trade their cattle or their sheep in Bath or whatever is going to come in by a different route 
to a central forum. Yeah? So it builds up in, a, in approximately a circle with looks like a, a bicycle wheel with spokes coming in. So actually, Athens is, is actually like that. That's exactly what Athens is like. If you decide, like Alexander the Great in 331 BC, having had a dream in which Homer appeared to you and said, found Alexandria here, then you don't do that. You think, what's a really beautiful, sensible use of land? I know it's a chessboard. It's a grid plan. And yes, we'll probably have walls around the edge. And yes, we'll probably have a forum in the centre. But we're going to have straight lines, which is the, the, the standard pattern of the designed, founded city. And there's an incredibly important difference between them. And the classic Roman imperial city is the chessboard, inc including um, Palmyra. It's got one of the longest, you know, it's, it's mile and a half that great avenue, which was designed so that the, that the queens and kings of Palmyra, like Zenobia, princess of the desert, who, 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 who uh, ruled it um, in, in the third century, in the later third century, and actually defied Rome far more frighteningly than Cleopatra ever did. Um, she would have processions that led... You know, it's all designed to, to, to actually celebrate the beauty of, of the place. And the, the streets are all marble, so they can be washed. It's all about washing and keeping clean. Because if you listen to Juvenal on Rome, you know, it's just a sheer putrefaction of the city, the ancient city, and the potties and, and, and everything. If you've got marble and drainage, then it's much, much easier to have a civic system that keeps it, it clean. What's very interesting to me, though, to get... Sorry, just to follow on to the grid pattern, is that when the... Um, uh, after the Industrial Revolution and the, the absolutely terrible things that had happened in the big cities in Britain, like Birmingham, Manchester, and London, and Glasgow, in terms of illness um, and mass wild building and, 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 and uncontrolled city, civic development, was the whole movement in the 1890s for the Garden City. And guess what they went back to? Concentric circles. That, that the whole idea was that actually we can inbuild far more green space an inbuilt, far more friendly space where people naturally come in and out from their suburbs, that the grid isn't actually terribly constructive in terms of community building. And I think that's still a question that haunts us. Mm. So you've got something very different built in Welling Garden City. It's sort of, um, and actually, they still were reading... I'm going to stop in a minute. I'm going all over the place here. But actually, Plato's account of Atlantis... <laughs> which is the mythical city, but the mythical perfect city, mm. which is concentric circles. So, yeah. um, and it's very clear that it is. And lemon trees as well. Yeah. Every good city has to have a lemon tree, and that's what's in Plato's Atlantis. So I've just ticked off four of your boxes. Exactly, so exactly. And I, was thinking, I can see the time. So I was going to do... I see we, we, Cities and Ideas is our title, so I thought perhaps we could... You know, I was just going to move on to... Yeah, indeed, ideas. hop over to Ideas. The, um, I mean, something just, just to kind of pick up on the Palmyra thing, I think it's very... There's, there's an amazing edict of 383 AD, and so this is the time when Christianity um, is uh, really kind of percolating out from Constantinople as the official religion uh, of the new Roman Empire based in Constantinople. And there's a beautiful edict which talks about the temples of, of, of Mesopotamia and it says that these temples should not be destroyed mm -hmm. because even though we disagree with their piety, we agree with their art. And it's an amazing... So although a lot actually was brought tumbling down at that time, there were a, that's why a lot of those temples have survived, because of that particular edict in 383 AD. So, I mean, that is, you know, historic England and the National Trust kind of writ large all those centuries ago. But just, just to kind of pick up... We're thinking about why... We, as Edith said, when we started... You know, a city isn't the buildings. It's and in etymologically, and aspirationally, and philosophically, it's the people who live within it that make a city. And so there's a question of why we do that thing, why we bother, because it's not necessarily the best way to live economically. It's not necessarily the best way to fill your bellies with food is to live in a city. So why are we driven to do that, to come together, to share ideas? And there's a very, I bet, even if there isn't a Babylonian cuneiform expert in the house, I bet there is a neuroscientist. Is there a neuroscientist? Oh, great. See, I can say anything, and, and, and they won't, <laughs> nobody would disagree with me. Well, I, um, uh, so I spend a lot of time with neuroscientists, and uh, there's a very uh, interesting new idea about what it is that actually defines us as a species. So I put this out there, and you can come back at me and tell me if you agree or disagree. 
that um, there's a notion that uh, we have really been underestimating how clever other primates are. Definitely. So what people think is that other apes have really, really big, complicated, clever ideas. And there's a kind of rather reductive experiment going on in Japan that demonstrates this, but quite kind of um, uh, in quite an articulate way. So there's a very clever girl ape in Japan. I can't remember her name, but if you go on YouTube, you'll find her. And she sits every day in a laboratory with mm. other scientists, and they've developed this computer program for her to beat. And she can beat the computer program. None of the scientists can. And it's a number sequencing process. And the numbers are fired at her incredibly quickly from 1 to 500. And she can sort them out in the sequence. And nobody, nobody can work out how she's managed to devise this system because it seems to be impossible. But the thing about that very, very clever girl ape, she does this brilliant thing every day. And every night, she goes back to her cage with her other ape friends. And she has a banana. She doesn't go back at night and go, you know, I'm doing this crazy thing every day. I have absolutely no idea what its purpose is. I really think it's pointless. But let me just tell you how I do it in case it's of use to you. Because it seems to have no function for her. She doesn't get any, she doesn't get any more food from having done it, so she hasn't worked out that this is something which is of, could be of real benefit. And what people think now is that, that we evolved 400,000 years ago, and it's a, it's a language thing, and we genetically evolve specifically so that we can articulate and communicate abstract ideas for which we don't understand the consequences. So we can articulate ideas and share ideas, even though we've got no idea where those are going to take us. Mm -hmm. And that's what then drives us to come together so that we have a cognitive group that's big enough so that when those ideas are shared, there's somebody that's going to go, oh, no, no, I think I know what you can do with that pen or glass or whatever it is that you've come up with the, the kind of prototype for. And I wonder if that's why cities happen, actually, is that we are genetically driven to communicate these abstract ideas. Well, that's exactly what Aristotle said, though, in one of the politics, exactly what he said, without using words like neuroscience, um, <laughs> even though he, he invented science, exactly. um, but um, was that cities are actually the... Um, his word is telos, teleology. It is the uh, state, the perfect state of being at which all humans um, are from birth somehow genetically wired mm. to create. And that's because, he said, it's all through koinonia, partnerships, so that human beings form partnerships all the time. They collaborate with other people. Your, most, your prior partnerships are with your husband or your wife or, or your children or your close kin. But then villages develop because different households discover that they're more than the sum of the parts, exactly by sharing both commodities and ideas, ideas. and actually brains. And he was quite clear that there's intellectual potentiality in all humans and that the city-state is simply an a, a inevitable agglomeration of interconnected households, then small towns, because it always, it's like compound interest as opposed to simple interest. It always more than gives you the sum of the parts. And he actually uses the analogy of uh, the civic feast, where uh, they, they're like, God, I wish I'd lived in platonic Athens. My goodness me. So if there was going to be a civic feast, everybody brought a dish along. But he says that because different people were good at cooking different things, so some are great patisserie chefs, and some do great beer, the whole meal for the city was far better than it could ever have been with any one household. And I think that's just such a wonderful image. I'm feeling really hungry now. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that idea of those, the, the combined skills, and he had absolutely cracked it, and it's already there in, in, in the politics. Mm. Um, I, I'm a little bit worried about the apes, though, because actually I suspect that there's also a fear, because alongside human, human cooperation, there always goes horrible rivalry and competition, mm. which is often exacerbated by close quarters, mm. right? So there is a danger, a dark side to this living in the city together. Um, my gentleman in Gloucester, the colonial, my 100 Jacurians, who uh, were the sort of senators of the city, were former soldiers from the 20th Legion. They um, all had a parcel of land. They had an allotment outside the city walls where they would go off and hang out during the day and, and grow shed, stuff. Probably. probably a shed. <laughs> What's the Latin for a shed? 
<laughs> so good. Shedos. Yes. All right, they had a shedos. And then they, <laughs> but then they came in. So they had a place to go off in the country. And that seems to me the absolute ideal, that you've got your country residents. A lot of my villas in the Cotswolds, actually. But I, live, I live up in the Cotswolds, and there are some great Roman villas up there parcel of land but then they came in to do the their, their collective thing and I think that's a really interesting mm, way right. of warding off the bad side yeah totally and that gorilla girl probably <laughs> knows that if she goes for the benefits or the money I mean what's she going to do with the mobile phone you know yeah she could say mobile phones could cause terrorism yeah I want my banana I know I respect it is really sorry I know that you're desperate so I'm just going to say one one thing and then I think because we probably want to Look, hear, hear from the audience point, yeah. okay so I just just very because there are two we just talked about these word ideas and competition and I and I just want to share with you my absolute favourite word slash word idea from the ancient world, indeed from prehistory, which completely relates to that. There are two, there are two in fact. One, um, as Edith will know very well, the very interesting word agon, which appears in Homer. And when it first appears in Homer, the word agon means a gathering place, in fact, a place that people come together, in fact, to have counsel. And very quickly, even in the Homeric epics themselves, that word agon then comes to mean a contest. So there's this notion, exactly as you say, that by definition, when we come together, we are going to compete with one another and we get the word agony from that. So that's, that's one. But there's a word which I, I think... In a sense, this this basically this is if I was to talk be if I was asked what the meaning of life is, I would say it is this one word um, idea, which is gosti, which is a Proto-Indo-European word, and gosti appears again. We think about eight thousand around kind of eight thousand BC. It's when it seems to be really employed in a sense by humans in order to kickstart civilization. And Gosti then splits up and it comes down through the Germanic route to us as the two words guest and host. So you can see what Gosti means initially. What it, and, and actually the word ghost as well. And the notion of Gosti works like this, that for those people who are living in Central Asia on the, the steppes of Siberia, southern Siberia, if they saw a little, a little shape of men on the horizon, rather than automatically assuming that those were rival tribes coming to raid them, rather than automatically assuming that they were malign and they were a danger. If you employ Gosti, this guest-host friendship relationship idea, you take the risk that it might be worthwhile letting yeah. those men across your threshold. And so you welcome them in because it could be that they're bringing new goods, new ideas, physically new blood, something to come into the gene pool. It could be that, in fact, they're going to come and rape your women and burn you down and steal your livestock. But you assume, you take an assumption that it's going to be better to let them in. And this then comes down into Greek as Xenia, this incredible idea, which is also this complicated guest-host friendship notion which really kind of operates um, in the Eastern Mediterranean world. And I just think Gosti is therefore the most beautiful mm. word idea, that in order to survive as a species, we have to take the risk of allowing the new, the strange, the unfamiliar physically across our threshold. And it seems to me that actually, again, kind of philosophically, that's a very important thing that we should always all remember to do. So, so remember that when you talk about a ghost. So the idea as well with a ghost is that it's a visitor that might be welcome or it might not be welcome. Mm. Right, so we can have another 10 minutes of being entirely entranced, um, or you can ask uh, a question if you'd like to. And obviously, we're, we're kind of, this is a very wide ranging discussion, and we will <laughs> very quickly at the end ask what we can learn from cities of the ancient world. And Edith and Bethany can come up with one thing each, perhaps, or something like that, that we can take into the future. Uh, but would any, can we just have an idea of whether anybody would like to make a point, ask a question? Um, you've mentioned many ancient cities, and some of these have obviously developed along very different paths, just to mention Athens versus Sparta, for example, which you've talked about. Now, ethnically, the citizens of those two cities must have been very similar, and yet somehow they evolved to follow these extremely different paths, so much so that in the end of war between them came kind of inevitable. So the question is, why? Why did these very similar people evolve along these two very different paths, but so close together geographically? Oh, well, I mean, that's, and that's something that the ancient authors ask themselves the whole time as well, because there are about a 1,000 Greek city-states. Uh, it's about... 2,020. Yeah, 2,020. Mm. Well, there we are, more than 1,000. More than and they, are, they have an absolute identity, an absolute sense of themselves. They share a language, as you say. They 
more often than not share the same gods. There are local gods and local spirits as well. But they share, and they share this Greekness. They talk about civilization as Tom Hellenicon, the Greek thing. So why is it? But I, I, I think I answered that possibly in the previous question, is that we are also driven to compete. Uh, Edith and I have done a great riff on this, looking at Bronze Age uh, civilizations and societies. You have this incredible thing with Bronze Age citadels, city-states, where they reach an extraordinary level of perfection, the exquisite jewellery that they produce, the artworks, probably the ideas. We haven't got those ideas written down. And then basically they just get greedy. They just start to look over across the horizon and say, we're fine in Mycenae, but actually wouldn't it be quite cool to have Argos as well? And at that point, we have this thesis, this is when you get the all-smiting male warrior god suddenly becomes very mm. um, uh, significant and it's a much more militaristic society. So I think, unfortunately, there, there is no re you know, what is the reason other than greed? Other well, than wanting I'd to I'd actually expand. disagree and say they're more similar than, than, than you think. I think that they're they responded in about the 8th century BC at a time of great famine and hardship and actually getting a living from the Greek land has always been unbelievably hard. All the different city-states responded in different ways to the same crisis. So, in fact, the pattern of a ruling class of 1 in 10 leisured, privileged guys to 9 hard-working ones was identical. It's just that and, and in Sparta, the top class, the, the Spartiates, that, the top one, uh, 10%, were extraordinarily de democratic amongst themselves, mm. far more egalitarian than the Athenians, extraordinarily so. But it was this military discipline thing, um, and they didn't have certain aspects of the democratic culture, the public debates, the public theatre, and so on. Athens, again, nine to one, slaves and workers and the free, but a different kind. I would actually put that difference down to Sparta not being a seaport. Mm. Most Greek cities are founded on the water. Mm. And the characteristic, rather open culture of the ancient Greeks, of which Athens is far more typical than Sparta, because it is ethnically hybrid and multicultural and, and, and revels in that. I mean, Pericles says we open our city to all people. That goes with ports. Mm. And Sparta weirdly were really more than a day's march from, from their own port. And the Greeks hardly ever settled a new city. They had this 25-mile rule, because 25 miles is seen in, in, in the ancient world as a day's... They didn't like it. They didn't often settle that far. So I think the Spartans are the weird ones, but actually, the social structure they came up with... I'm sorry, if you're going to look at it in purely sociological terms about power and privilege and freedom in proportion to labour was pretty much the same. Mm. We're becoming more aware of the threat posed by major geological and meteorological events. The ancients experienced lots of these and they left us with a great many tales. Um, you've mentioned Thera. If there's one thing that we can learn from the ancients about how cities might deal with natural hazards, what do you think that would be? Goodness. Well, I mean, apart from... The, the, the fundamental thing that they tried to mitigate against that, they built specifically for the geoseismic events that they knew that they were surrounded by. And every single aspect of that bit of town planning, it relates to trying to stop the houses falling down when you have the earthquake. So that is something that we can definitely learn, rather than having this ridiculous idea that none of us are ever going to die and that accidents and natural disasters are never going to happen. We should presume, and again, this is because the ancients were more fearful and they understood that these were punishments from the gods, so they had to listen to the gods, we should presume that these things are going to happen and, be, and think ahead. And I think that that ties back to my clever ape girl. We should just use our imaginations to imagine the worst so that we build for it and mitigate against it. And it drives me absolutely mad that there's this short-termism in the way that we plan our sisters and, and live in them. Um, would you say that the epic of Gilgamesh enshrines the view that the city and civility um, are essentially opposed to nature. No. And how far were the identities um, of the Greek cities formed on an, op on an oppositional basis? I don't think they did it consciously. I think their historians developed that. Mm. I think we've inherited from people like Thucydides and Herodotus, who are the ones who described these great cities to us, and Polybius and Plutarch later, all of them, they loved oppositional thinking. Mm. In ancient Greek, you've got this little 
<laughs> grammar thing going on, which means you don't have to say on the one hand and on the other hand every time. You just go men, there. So you say Athens, uh, multicultural men, Sparta, xenophobic, there. Right? And you just structure the whole language like that. They thought in polarities. So I think once they'd actually got their cities, absolutely they started saying, we are the taciturn ones of few words but great deeds. They are the loquacious ones. But I think that that's, if you like, subsequent or a consequent upon the phenomenological god, listen to me, <laughs> send me back to uni, mm -hmm. on the reality that has developed. Mm. And just actually, to, we're talking about archaeology, to add a bit of archaeology into that, that there's, um, we, we, we're now, we now realise there was a lot more travel, a lot more yeah, consistent yeah. travel all from all the time, from all levels of society, and we just don't have that in the record because you're too busy travelling to actually mm. kind of leave, leave a diary and Thucydides isn't going to write about a little family travelling in between where it is, Stagira and down to Athens. But we know, and it's very useful genetically, we can tell that people are moving around a lot more, which means there's a lot more involvement with one another's cities, for instance. And that's where the hearth comes in, because people yeah. look, they have these great goddesses of the hearth. The hearth is a crucial symbol. If you have a new baby, the father has on the 10th day to accept the baby by running naked around the hearth with the new baby. The hearth is portable. Yeah. It's like a giant Bunsen burner. Yeah. And so people go into archaeological things looking for the fireplace. There are no fireplaces in ancient mm. Greece because your family is your portable hearth. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And just, I'm just sorry, just <laughs> the rate of, do you, you can both, both go on. I know, there's a little tiny thing with that. that there's this lovely Democritus who discovers the atom. There's this brilliant thing when he travels down from northern Greece to Athens. And he says, kind of, in my hometown, I'm this big star. And I come to Athens, nobody knows who I am. It's oh. so sort of kind of pathetic, really, but rather sweet. And again, I think something that we can completely recognise. You know, I'm a big fish back at home, but, you know, there's loads of them here in Athens. It's really annoying. Abdera. No, was he Abdera? Abdera. 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 Okay, Abdera. listen, yeah, what can future yeah. cities learn from the, um, the past? The ancient, okay, it, just very yeah, quickly, the ancient, one thing. The skill of <laughs> utopian thinking. It's not the city itself, but we all need to carry on, like Plato in the Republic, planning what we think is a good place. We've lost the art of thinking positively about what we could do together. Yeah, I, and, I, and I think it's utopian thinking. There's a reason that we talk about cities as dream places. Because it's a places they are places that are both dreams and that we dream about and within which we can have dreams. And I think that is the point of living in a city, is actually... All the, the beautiful architecture, the nice food is an add-on. It is there so that we can find the very best kind of society that we can be by sharing ideas within that central space in the Agora. Amazing. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Shall we clap and then just... <laughs>